uh, during dinner this past week, Ashley and I were uh, trying to be intentional with our kids and try to have some kind of spiritual conversation around dinner. And we were talking to our kids about uh, the book of Ecclesiastes. If you don't know, we have three kids, 13, 10, 7. And we were talking about a particular portion of Ecclesiastes that is probably familiar to you. Even if you're not that familiar with the Bible, you probably heard it before. And uh, Solomon writes that there's a time for everything. There's a season for everything under the sun. And then he lists examples. There's a time to mourn and there's a time to rejoice, right? And he kind of gives a bunch of different examples. And the kind of point is, and this is what we were trying to share with our kids, especially as my daughter has uh, just graduated from middle school, getting ready to step into uh, high school, which ages me in ways that I did not expect. Um, but... Uh, we were trying to help them see that part of wisdom is, is being aware of what season you're in and then being able to discern how to appropriately act in that season. So there is a season of mourning. You want to act appropriately in that season. You want to grieve. You want to weep with those who weep. You don't want to be the person that shows up in a time, a situation of mourning. And some of us, right, because our emotional issues, you all know how to handle like grief and awkward situations. And so you just start kind of laughing uh, in those moments. Some of us are like that, right? That's the whole thing. You should see somebody. Uh, but you don't want to be the person that, that's just boisterous and loud and like, like everything is great in, in a season or situation of mourning. But then there's a season also of rejoicing. And even though there is grief and there's heaviness and hardship in life, you want to be able to know that there's a time to rejoice with those who rejoice. So knowing what season you're in and then being able to discern how to act appropriately in that season, that's a part of wisdom. We were helping them kind of understand that. Now, you think about the different seasons that you've walked through in life. Anybody remember transitioning from elementary school to middle school? Yeah, I see some of y'all hands. I don't know how y'all remember this. Uh, I don't know why. I actually do remember it uh, myself. Some of y'all are like, because I'm in middle school right now. Okay, yeah. But uh, I remember this because I was born in Richmond, Virginia. My family's from uh, D.C., from the D.C. metro area. But my dad's first church that he pastor was in Richmond. And we moved back to the D.C. area when I was 11. So right as I'm getting ready to, to transition... Uh, and I, I show up, I'm, I'm transitioning into middle school here in the DMV area, and there were these boots that were really popular, Timberland boots. Y'all remember? Particularly tan Timberland boots. Now, I know Gen Z is like, yeah, but then Timberlands are kind of popping. Listen, this is not yours, right? We started that, okay? <laughs> Actually, we didn't start it. Some construction worker started it, but... <laughs> Right? We started the trend. We started the vibe. You know what I mean? With tan Timberland boots. So I noticed that tan boots are popping in the DMV area. So around Christmas time, I asked my parents for tan boots. They granted me my wish. I was so excited. I showed up to middle school with my tan boots. What I was not aware of was that it was a particular brand. You know Timberland boots got the little tree on the side, right? Well, I saw up the school and my boots had a hand with a hammer in it on the side. <laughs> These were not for style. These were purely for function, okay? And so I just, I was not aware. That, that transitional season for me was difficult, okay, in the middle school. Anybody remember your transition from middle school to high school? Yeah, some of us remember that. My high school had 3,000 people in it, y'all. So you remember that feeling of walking into the cafeteria and not knowing who, who to sit with at lunch? You know what I mean? Like, that can be like an overwhelming feeling, especially if you're new to a high school or you just are in this new environment. Anybody remember if you went to college or what it was like showing up on campus, moving in, right? You're, you're experiencing this kind of freedom for the first time. You don't know who are your friends going to be. You're trying to navigate where to go on campus and what time. You remember what it felt like to get a syllabus and realize... This right here is how you know what your homework is. Like, this is it. You know what I'm saying? And you just file it away. You don't look at it again. Well, that, maybe that was just me, right? So, so we know what those seasons are like. I could go on and on and on. If, if you are a parent, you remember what it was like when you brought your first child home. Exhilarating. Terrifying. Terrifying. Somebody legally allowed you to take that child home. 
There's no 911 for nurses, right? Or, or, or like, no, 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 it's, it's on you, right? We could go on and on. Listen, one of the most challenging but also promising seasons in life is what a lot of people call adulting. And that is the name of the series we're getting ready to start today. It's called Adulting in Real Life. Adulting IRL. If you didn't know, IRL stands for in real life, okay? Adulting IRL is the series we're getting ready to start because, and let me just catch you up. If you don't know what adulting means, adulting is that transitional season where you begin to take on the kind of responsibilities of mature adulthood. And so as I'm thinking about people here and watching from our different locations, I'm thinking about people who are getting ready to go to college. I'm thinking about some of you who just graduated from college and you're getting ready to kind of step out into like the, the work world. Or maybe you, you, you did a gap year or maybe you didn't even go to college, but you're getting ready to pick up a trade or, or start a job or you're, in, you're entering the workforce in, in, in some way. That season of beginning to take on the responsibilities of adulthood is so promising, but it also can feel a little bit overwhelming. And so we're starting this series that is going to apply to everybody, uh, but specifically wanted to target those who are kind of entering into that season of adulthood. And for those of us who have been in that season for a while, there's still a lot we can learn because we are going uh, to be studying the book of Proverbs uh, together. And we're going to be looking at God's word uh, to, to gain wisdom in all kinds of areas that have to do with the responsibilities of growing up as an adult, managing our money, friendship, other relationships, making plans and discerning God's will, all of these challenges uh, that God wants to speak into as we cultivate uh, wisdom. And listen, here's why we want to look to the Proverbs. We need God's wisdom because we all have been in those situations, particularly in the, that adulting, those beginning adulting years where we've been like, how was I supposed to know what to do? You've had those moments. For me, right, when, I, when my wife and I were engaged and it might have even been when we first got married, I was like, hey, I want to cook her dinner. You're like, why did it take you so long to cook her dinner? Because I didn't know how to cook, right? So what I did was, anybody know this? I got some skillet sensations. You know what that is? It's a bag at Safeway of pre-made frozen food. It's very simple, very, very dummy proof, right? Apparently not. All you do is dump the bag into a skillet and stir occasionally. That is it. That's it. Well, I, 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 context, I also was watching an NBA game while I was doing this, but it said put it in there for eight minutes, okay? Wasn't fully paying attention. So I like turned the timer on. I am meant to put it on for eight minutes. I actually put it on for eight hours, okay? <laughs> You're supposed to stand and, and stir occasionally. I said, for what? I went to watch the NBA game. I just started smelling danger, okay? <laughs> I can't, bottom line is I have pictures. I tried to find out, I can't, my wife has the picture. I, I couldn't show it. Everything in that pan was black, all right? We ordered out. How was I supposed to know? How to, how to do this, right? The instructions on the back. Well, I just didn't have the wisdom I needed, right? We have other moments like that. When you first, you're driving and you first experience a flat tire without your parents. You thought you really knew what to do until you were stranded on 495, right? You get in your first accident. People explain you're supposed to exchange information. You can't remember what information, you know, to get. Like, how are you supposed to know? How was I supposed to know? that April 15th was significant. <laughs> Taxes are due, what are you talking about? You know what I mean? Like there's all these situations as we're taking on more and more responsibility and we just don't know exactly what to do. And our parents are supposed to train us and teach us these things. Some of us didn't have that, but even if we have parents that did, they can't prepare us for every single situation in life. We need wisdom. And God desires to give us that. And that's why we want to spend some time over the next several weeks looking at the book of Proverbs. So here's what I want to do. I want to read from Proverbs chapter 3, verse 13 uh, to 22, give you some context. And then I want us to kind of set up this series by looking at uh, the significance of wisdom that we see here. We ready? Come on, y'all. Help me out. Other locations. We ready? All right. Proverbs chapter 3. 
We'll pick it up in verse 13. It says, blessed is the one who finds wisdom and the one who gets understanding. For the gain from her is better than gain from silver and her profit better than gold. She is more precious than jewels and nothing you desire can compare with her. Long life is in her right hand. In her left hand are riches and honor. Her ways are ways of pleasantness and all her paths are peace. She is a tree of life to those who lay hold of her and those who hold her fast are called blessed. The Lord by wisdom founded the earth. By understanding, he established the heavens. By his knowledge, the deeps broke open and the clouds dropped down the dew. My son, do not lose sight of these. Keep sound wisdom and discretion and they will be life for your soul and adornment for your neck. Why don't you take a moment before we dive in here and just ask God to speak to you personally through his word. Take a moment between you and the Lord. Father, we thank you that you have not left us in the dark. God, whether we're young adults and we're emerging into adulthood or we've been walking through life for decades, God, you meet us where we are and you desire to not only speak to our hearts, Father, but to work in our hearts in ways that change our lives. And so, Father, we invite you to do that now as we give attention to your word. We pray this in Jesus' name. All God's people said, amen, amen. Amen. Well, let me give you some context before we dive into this passage. Proverbs, uh, the main author of uh, Proverbs, which is a collection of, of wise sayings, the main author is a man named King Solomon. Now, he didn't write all the Proverbs, but he wrote the overwhelming majority of them or collected them. Proverbs is 31 chapters. And King Solomon was a very successful man. He was a godly man in the beginning of his life. And over the course of his life, he begins to drift away from his relationship with God. And he kind of ends in a place that that wasn't ideal. We'll talk about that. But he's writing uh, to, you see that in in, uh, Proverbs 1 through 9, uh, it's a series of messages in this collection of wise sayings. The immediate audience is for his son, who's going to take over the kingdom. And he's trying to prepare his son to to be wise, to be a wise leader and to know how to flourish and to lead a flourishing kingdom. But the Holy Spirit inspires Solomon to to write this in a way that really applies more broadly to everybody. And you see that in Proverbs chapter one as it as it starts out. Now, the purpose, as you'll see in Proverbs chapter one, if you go back and you read that, the purpose is very clear. It's to help people and particularly young people grow in wisdom. And as you read Proverbs, it shows that since God has designed the world and us to operate in a certain way, true wisdom grows out of a right relationship with God. Now, a couple things you got to know about Proverbs to be able to interpret it uh, uh, appropriately. A lot of us, even if you're not a Christian, You've, you're maybe familiar with some Proverbs. A lot of Proverbs are very popular. You don't, need, you don't even have to be a Christian to be able to glean wisdom from the Proverbs. But there are some things that are helpful to understand if you're going to interpret them uh, accurately. Number one, the Proverbs is poetry, right? It's, it's, it's poetry. Um, speaking of like a, a adulting, uh, some of y'all, you know, you write poetry, you know, for, for, for girls and stuff like that. And it's, it's not great, right? And you just think all poetry rhymes and you end up sounding like Dr. Seuss. But I applaud, I applaud, right, the effort, all right? This is good poetry right here in Proverbs, okay? And a couple things about poetry that you got to know. Poetry here is built around a lot of figures of speech. Figures of speech is creative language that's used to communicate a message, all right? Creative language. So, for example, as we just read in Proverbs chapter 3, you saw that wisdom was described as a woman. She has these things. Some people, especially in a lot of liberal theology, will kind of distort this passage to try to say, well, it means God is a woman. 
That's a, a misinterpretation and distortion of this passage. It, you don't understand poetry. This is poetry. This is what's called personification. It's basically when you take like attributes and you kind of describe them as, as if they're kind of a person in order to kind of show what it looks like in real life. And what, what Solomon is doing is he's saying these are divine attributes, wisdom. These attributes of wisdom are attributes of God himself. But he personifies them so you can see how they actually function. And the reason why he describes wisdom as a woman is because, first of all, low-key women, a lot of times y'all are wiser than us. That's number one. Number two, though, is because he's writing to his young son. And he's saying this, son, as you walk through the journey in the path of life, there are going to be different voices that you're going to hear in life. And what he says here is what's called lady wisdom is one voice. But as you read through Proverbs, there's another woman that he personifies, and that's lady folly. And lady folly is the temptation that draws you away from the wisdom of God. And he says, listen, he, he wants to describe wisdom to his son in a way that communicates, I want you to be attracted to godly wisdom. I want you to develop a relationship with godly wisdom as you navigate life rather than developing a relationship with foolishness and with sin and rebellion against God. That's a figure of speech. It's creative language designed to communicate a message. And then Proverbs is also poetry in the sense that it's built around parallelism. You notice that as you read through Proverbs, usually one thought will be, you, will be expressed in multiple lines. And, and so there's, there's one kind of main thought, and then a lot of times the second or third line will emphasize or elaborate on the previous line in some way. So it's poetry. Here's the last thing you got to understand. Proverbs is, is guidelines, not guarantees. Or, or some uh, scholars will say it's, it's princi general principles, but not, not uh, necessarily promises. Proverbs, what Proverbs is doing is it's showing us how life normally operates. And so these are guidelines for how you are to live your life. And it's saying that if you live your life according to these wise principles, generally speaking, your life is going to be better. This is how life is going to operate. If you save money over time, you're going to have more money. That's generally how it operates. But it's not a guarantee because we all know that life isn't as clean cut as that. There's economic depressions. You, you, you'll see in Proverbs that there's oppression where the poor are, are working hard. And although hard work and diligence should lead to, it should be fruitful labor that leads to more resources. There's sometimes where people in power use that power in order to actually take those resources. So life is complex. So it's, it's, it's got general guidelines for how life generally operates, but it's not necessarily guarantees. Reveals things that are usually true, but not necessarily always true. So that's a brief overview of Proverbs to help you understand how Proverbs is organized and how to interpret it. Here's what I want us to do in the time that we have left. From Proverbs chapter 3, as we begin to set up this series, and we're going to be looking for God's wisdom as it relates to money and relationships and temptation and sexuality and all these different things, I want to answer three questions to set us up from Proverbs chapter 3. Very simply, why is wisdom so important? What is wisdom? And then how do we get it? Why is it so important? What is it? And then how do we get wisdom? How do we grow in and cultivate wisdom? Number one, why is wisdom so important? Now, that can sound like a dumb question, right? Because all of us know well, wisdom is important. But slow down for a minute because Solomon makes a really bold claim in Proverbs chapter 3. He says in verse 14, he says, the gain from wisdom is better than gain from silver and her profit is better than gold. He says, wisdom is more precious than jewels and nothing you desire. This is a strong statement. Nothing you desire can compare with wisdom. He repeats this idea all throughout the Proverbs. One other example is in Proverbs chapter 8. I would encourage you sometime this week to just slowly read through Proverbs chapter 8, the whole chapter, 
But he says this in Proverbs chapter 8, verse 10. He says, take my instruction instead of silver and knowledge rather than choice gold. For wisdom is better than jewels and all that you may desire cannot compare with her. He says, take wisdom over money. Take wisdom over the pay increase. Take wisdom over the lucrative career. Take wisdom over anything else. He's basically saying wisdom is more valuable than the most valuable thing you can possibly think of, the most valuable thing you desire. And the question is, why does Solomon or really the Holy Spirit through Solomon keep emphasizing this? And here's why. Because Solomon knows, and obviously God knows, that all of us are tempted to organize our lives around the wrong things. We're tempted to aim our ambitions at the wrong targets. This is so true as we're starting out life and as we're continuing in life that all of us are prone to wander in our hearts and we begin to chase after not the things that are best or the things that are most wise, but we can begin to chase after what we think is best. We become wise in our own eyes because there's all these other voices that are calling for us. There's the voice of status that says the good life is just by continuing to level up in life and and to just kind of outpace everybody else. There's the voice of of satisfaction that says the way to live the good life is just to do whatever feels good to you. Whatever brings you pleasure in the moment, do that. There's the voice of self-expression that is maybe one of the loudest voices in our culture today that says the way to find the good life is to just do you, to live your truth, to live authentically, which can be a good thing, but what typically our culture means is that that you get to define what is good for, for you. And so however you identify or or whatever you most desire or whatever you choose to believe in this particular season or phase of your life, whatever is inside of you is what is objectively true. It's the voice of self-expression, or maybe it's the voice of significance. We live in a prestige economy where everybody wants to be an influencer. It is one of the number one in surveys for emerging generations. One of the top career ambitions is essentially to be an influencer. We live in this prestige economy where we want to pursue significance through platform. There are all of these voices. And Solomon knows and the Holy Spirit knows that we are tempted to organize and aim our lives at the wrong things. I want you to hear from one of the greatest philosophers of our time, the one and only Justin Bieber. (laughs) And I know he was kind of a, 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 you know, he's from a previous generation, but he's, he's grown up a little bit and it's helpful to kind of see, right? His perspective as he's grown up, this is from 2019, so he even has more perspective now, but he wrote, he, put, he had this long viral Instagram post in 2019, and he talked about being overwhelmed and uh, feeling a, a cycle of feeling disappointment after disappointment. He says, sometimes it can even get to the point where you don't even want to live anymore. And then he said this, he said, you see, I have a lot of money, clothes and cars and accolades and achievements, awards. And he says, and I was still unfulfilled. He says, have you noticed the statistics of child stars and the outcome of their life? There's an insane pressure and responsibility put on a child whose brain and emotions aren't developed yet. He says, no rationality, defiant, rebellious things all of us have to go through. He says, but when you add the pressure of stardom, it does something to you that is quite unexplainable. And then he goes on to say, as my talent progressed and I became ultra successful, it happened within a strand of two years, my whole world was flipped on its head. I went from a 13-year-old boy from a small town to being praised left and right by the world with millions saying how much they loved me and how great I was. And then he said, by the the time I was 18, he said, I had no skills in the real world with millions of dollars and access to whatever I wanted. He said, this is a very scary concept for anyone. By 20, I made every bad decision you could have thought of and went from one of the most loved and adored people in the world 
to the most ridiculed, judged, and hated person in the world. And he, his, he went on a downward spiral. What Justin Bieber is saying, and you can think, any celebrity, we read it over and over again. They're saying the good life is not found in the accumulation of all of these things because you get those things and you realize it's still empty. It's still empty. And that's why Old Testament scholar Dr. Bruce Walkie, he said, commenting on Proverbs 3, he said, money can give food but not fellowship, a house not a home, jewelry but not love. Material things can never give you, it's not designed to be able to give you the things that your heart most deeply longs for. They can be good gifts from God, but in and of themselves, those things cannot give you what your heart most deeply longs for. And yet we aim our lives at those things. And wisdom comes along and begins to give you things that material things cannot give you. That's why it's more precious than jewelry. It's more precious than the most valuable thing you can think of. And here's ultimately why wisdom is so valuable and important. As you read throughout Proverbs, here's, here's why. Because wisdom brings your life into alignment with God's design. That is the purpose of wisdom. It's not just to make you smarter. It's not just to give you a life hack. It is to bring your life into alignment with God's design. And that's what you see in Proverbs 3, verse 19. You saw how he, Solomon talks about God's work in creation. He says, the Lord by wisdom founded the earth or laid the earth's foundations. By understanding, he established the heavens. And by his knowledge, the deeps broke or the watery depths were divided and the clouds dropped down the dew. He's saying God created the earth and he created like all of the different galaxies and stars and all of that. And God created the land, he created the sea and he brought order to all of it. And what you see revealed in the Proverbs is that nature is not the result of chance. And it's not even like old ancient cultures who saw nature as the result of like this clash or, or, or uh, power struggle between the gods. No, he, the, the, in Proverbs we learn and the Bible teaches us that nature is the result of divine wisdom. And what we're going to see is that there is a divine pattern woven into the fabric of the physical world that God not only created all of creation by divine wisdom with intentionality and skill, but, but that God also embedded his wisdom into the world, and that's why the world operates the way it does. That there is a pattern in the physical world. There's the law of aerodynamics. You would be wise not to try to fight against it. Even if we can figure out how to fly airplanes, we are using the laws of aerodynamics. There's the law of gravity, which feels like relative truth when you're young. The older you get, it becomes absolute truth, okay? Just try being 42 and continuing to play basketball. It's, it's going to get you at some point, okay? God designed the world, and it operates according to his wisdom. And listen, here's the logic of the Proverbs, that just like there is a wise pattern woven into the fabric of the physical world, the same is true morally and relationally and spiritually, that God has designed the world and us to operate a certain way. And so as we learn and apply God's wisdom, we align our lives with God's design. And as we are aligned with God's design, that's when we become, we begin to step into the center of our joy and our own flourishing. This is why wisdom is so important, because it brings our lives into alignment with God's design, and his design is for his glory and is for our joy. That's why verse 13 says, blessed is the one who finds wisdom. It is a blessed life or truly happy. It's a happiness that comes from a relationship with God, a profound joy in living life according to God's design. So then what is wisdom? We know why it's important. What is it, though? Well, the Bible never gives a concise definition of the word wisdom. Instead, it gives us pictures and descriptions 
of what wisdom actually looks like in real life. Because wisdom in scripture is not just an idea or just information. Wisdom really is like emotion. You see wisdom in the way people live. That's why the Hebrew word for wisdom actually means the skill or ability to do something well. We don't have, I don't have time to, to take you to all these passages, but if you study the Hebrew word for wisdom, it's interesting because that same word translated wisdom is in other places translated the, the, uh, as like the skill that an artist or craftsman have. So the people, the artists and the craftsmen that were building the tabernacle, that skill is the same word that's translated wisdom. The wisdom that kings use to lead well, the skill of leadership, that same word is translated wisdom. And so when you look at how Proverbs opens in chapter 1, verses 1 through 6, it's this introduction to the book, and it introduces the purpose of the book. And you see it in Proverbs 3 as well. There's all these synonyms throughout the book of Proverbs for wisdom, instruction, and discernment, and understanding, and insight, and prudence, and knowledge. Like all of these different facets, it's like a diamond that you're turning and you're looking at different dimensions of wisdom. But it's not just those things. In, in Proverbs 1, it's interesting because it also says as a part of wisdom, there's righteousness, justice, and equity. What that is showing us is this, that wisdom is not just knowing what's right, but doing what's right. And here's the implication of the Proverbs. There's no divide between our spiritual life and our regular life. All of life is to be lived according to the wisdom and purposes of God. God wants to give us wisdom in every area of our life, financially, relationally, sexually, every area of our life. And so let me, let me pull that together into a simple definition. Because you're like, Mike, you said a lot. You still haven't answered the question. Let me answer the question. Here's my best attempt at defining what wisdom is according to Scripture. Wisdom is knowing how to flourish in life according to God's design. It's knowing how to flourish in life according to God's design. And that's why in Proverbs 3, verse 16, it says, Long life is in her right hand, and in her left hand are riches and honor. I love that. It's not just riches, right, but it's riches and that in an honorable way. It says, her ways are ways of pleasantness, and all her paths are peace. She is a tree of life. That's uh, an echo to the garden, to, paraly- to, to paradise, to life according to God's design. She is a tree of life to those who lay hold of her, and those who hold wisdom fast are called blessed. It's the good life. It's knowing how to flourish in life according to God's design, how to flourish in every area of your life. Now, some of us should feel attention as we hear that because we look at this and we're like, well, is the Bible saying that the wiser you are, the longer you're going to live because I have enough experience in life to know that's not necessarily true? Is the Bible saying that just because you're wise, it means you're going to be rich? Because I consider myself a wise person, but the way my bank account is set up, it's not reflecting the wisdom of God, right? We know, we know that wisdom doesn't always mean long life. Wisdom doesn't always mean riches. So is the Bible true or not? Well, remember what I said. Proverbs are guidelines, not guarantees. It's saying this is generally how life works, but, that's, but it doesn't always work in that exact same way. In fact, we know, we know New Testament, Jesus is clear, in this world you will have trouble. In fact, he promises that as a result of following him, there are difficulties we're going to experience in life and sacrifices that we're going to have to make. And we even see that in the Old Testament. So as you're understanding the Proverbs, you've got to put it in the context of wisdom literature. And let me show you, this is why I love studying the Bible, because, listen, the Bible is not just naive. Like, as you study the Bible, you begin to see these treasures of wisdom that actually make sense of the world and make sense of your experience in the world. So Proverbs lays out the basic approach to life. If you live according to these wise principles consistently, generally speaking, generally speaking, your life is going to go better. But the Bible doesn't stop with that because then you look at the book of Job. 
And the book of Job says, wait a minute, one exception to that is suffering. Particularly the suffering of the righteous. Job starts out, he's one of the most righteous men on the planet. Blameless. Faithful to God's covenant. And yet he experiences unimaginable suffering. And the rest of the book of Job is just confusion. Even at the end, Job is wrestling in his relationship with God. God finally speaks and basically points back to creation and says, Job, you're talking real heavy, but where were you when I created the sun, the moon, and the stars? Where were you when I founded the earth? Where were you when I, through my divine wisdom, created everything? And then the book ends. You're welcome. (laughs) Job is a part of wisdom literature. It's saying, okay, Proverbs reveals, here's how life generally works. But God in his kindness says to us, "But but you live in a fallen world and life isn't always that neat. And so suffering is one of those areas where the rules don't seem to apply. And God acknowledges, for some of us who are here, and we need to hear this, he acknowledges when suffering really hits your life, when it is no longer an idea, but it is your personal experience, it is appropriate and it is completely understandable for you to be confused. God, why? God, I never thought I would be at this place. I don't understand why you're not answering this prayer. And then Ecclesiastes, also written by Solomon, at the end of his life, after he's gained wealth and honor and fame, and he had all of these like multitudes of wives, his dating game was crazy, all right? And he he gets all of that and he drifts away from God. And at the end of his life, he uh, writes Ecclesiastes. And the whole book of the Ecclesiastes is an exception to the rule of Proverbs because Solomon has been doing all of these things. He has the money, he has the honor, he has all of this. You know what he can't find though? Meaning in life. And he realizes meaning in life doesn't necessarily play by all the rules, that you can do all the things that society tells you to do, and yet you can be empty on the other side of it like Justin Bieber experienced. And so the the wisdom of God speaks into our real world experience and says, generally speaking, this is how you should live your life. But in a fallen, broken world under the curse of sin, there are going to be some things that scramble how you understand life to operate. And it leaves us longing and, 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 and prayerfully it leads us to God's wisdom so we can understand it in the context of what God is doing. One of the best pictures of wisdom in the Bible is in Psalm 1. It's the picture of a tree that's planted by streams of water. And its leaf doesn't wither and it bears fruit in due season. And the reason that's one of the best pictures of wisdom in the Bible is because here you have this tree that's planted by streams of water. That is the wisdom of God. That is a relationship with God. And no matter what the season is or what the circumstances or like, whether it's drought or whether it's rain or whatever it is, in every circumstance, in every situation, in every season, this tree is flourishing. That's the picture of wisdom, that even though your circumstances may not be everything you want them to be or expected them to be. Wisdom is knowing how to flourish in life according to God's design, no matter what situation or season you find yourself in. That is the picture and that is the beauty of the wisdom of God. That you can actually Learn how to live a life where you are thriving and you are flourishing. It's not that you have all the money you want or all the money that they have. It's not that everything works out perfectly in your career. It's not that you don't experience suffering and disappointment, but the wisdom of God leads you into abundant life, the kind of life that is rooted and grounded in him and not your circumstances. So how do we gain wisdom? As we're growing up, as we're adulting, as we're trying to navigate the complexities of life, how do you gain wisdom? Well, that's what we're going to be looking at, Lord willing, throughout this series in all of these different areas of life. But as we prepare to close, let me just kind of set this up for you and just give a framework 
for how we're going to walk through these different categories. You got to understand some things if you're going to grow in wisdom. Here's the first thing. If you're taking notes, here's the first thing. One, wisdom is a pursuit. It's a pursuit. That's why it says, listen, that's why it says, blessed is the person who finds wisdom. It's, it's an aggressive, it's the result of an aggressive and constant search for it. That's why you read throughout the Proverbs and it says, seek wisdom, get wisdom, preserve wisdom. Don't let wisdom out of your sight. In fact, Proverbs chapter four, verse seven, it says, the beginning of wisdom is this, get wisdom, though it cost all you have, Get understanding. Listen to me. Everybody, generally speaking, everybody grows older, but not everybody grows wiser. Come on, y'all. We all know some old fools. We do. We got some uncles. It's always uncles in these examples. I don't know why. What is it about uncles? It's always uncles. Everybody grows older, but not everybody grows wiser. Why? Because we, we don't all pursue wisdom. It is a constant pursuit. It's, it's in every situation God wants us to become the people, the kind of people who are seeking godly wisdom for that situation, no matter what it is. Uh, money, relationships, friendships, every situation and season of life, we are pursuing and seeking God's wisdom in, in God's word and in wise counsel and just through common sense. We are seeking the wisdom that comes from God and the wisdom that is embedded in the world that God created. Wisdom is a pursuit. Secondly, if you want to grow in wisdom, you got to know wisdom is a practice. We've already talked about this. Wisdom is not just head knowledge. It's not just book smarts. We also know a lot of smart fools. You know a wise person by how they live their life, not their PhD. So wisdom is a practice. It is taking the principles that God reveals in his word and in creation and applying those principles consistently to the point where, by God's grace, you become to integrate those things into your life and your character, and then you become a person of wisdom. And you want to know how to discern God's will for your life? Become a person of wisdom. Why? Because then in every situation and season of your life, you will have the kind of discernment from God's perspective to read the situation and know how to make wise choices. Wisdom is a practice. The reality of the matter is, all of us, all of us have failed. Every single one of us. We, we haven't pursued wisdom in every season and situation. We haven't practiced wisdom, and some of us live in the consequences of that. We have lived against the grain of God's design. Some of us just in our foolishness, some of us in our sin and our rebellion, we have intentionally said, no, I'm going to be wise in my own eyes. I'm going to live life my own way. I'm going to pursue what I want to pursue. And so every single one of us have forfeited the benefits of wisdom. Every single one of us. We have ripped the tree from the roots. And we have said, God, I want your benefits, but I do not want your wisdom. God, I, I want everything you have to offer me, but I do not want it your way. Every single one of us have done that before. And some of us are living in the fallout of that in our marriage, in our, in our finances, in, in our other broken relationships, in our physical health. We have rammed our lives against the wall because we have refused to listen to God's wisdom. But that is ultimately true for every single one of us spiritually when it comes to our sin. We have broken God's covenant. We have rejected God's wisdom and his authority. And because of that, we deserve nothing good from God. Nothing. We don't deserve the benefits of wisdom. In fact, we deserve his judgment and his punishment. And here's what God does. Here's what God does. God says they, are, they have not and they cannot live up to the standards and the guidelines of wisdom that, are, that, that help them live according to my design. 
And that's why our great hope is not in the pursuit of wisdom or even the the practice of wisdom, but our greatest hope is the fact that wisdom is ultimately a person. It's a person. And this is why as you study the book of Proverbs, it says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom because wisdom starts with us acknowledging that God is God and we are not of seeing God for who he really is, that he is the one who actually created this world that we live in and enjoy, and he embedded his wisdom into the world, and he has revealed that wisdom to us. And and as we see him for who he is, our creator and our judge, it humbles us before him. It, it, It puts our hearts in a posture to receive his wisdom. And then we begin to see, we begin to see the good news of the gospel, that he sent this person, Jesus, to live the perfectly wise and righteous life that we should have lived, but we haven't lived. And then Jesus dies in our place for our sins. The wisdom of the ages revealed on the cross that this is what God has been up to all along. The the divine eternal wisdom of God put on display in the massacre of the Son of God on the cross. And it made no sense for three days until he rose from the grave. And the fruit of wisdom, of God's eternal redemptive wisdom, began to be evident as Jesus began to show and demonstrate that he is who he says he is, and he distributes the benefits of wisdom to everyone who will come to him, who will trust in his sacrifice and his leadership for their life. And so for you and for me, the beginning of wisdom starts with us acknowledging that, God, we need forgiveness. And we need a relationship with you. And we need you to download your wisdom by your spirit into our new hearts so that we might walk in ways that bring flourishing to us and others according to your design. And you can have it. You can have it. And so I want to give us a moment to just respond to the Lord. You and I need the wisdom of God. Maybe it's in a specific situation in your life right now, a decision that you have to make, a challenge that you're trying to face, just a season that is kind of confusing. Maybe you need his wisdom right now in a specific situation. Or maybe you need to zoom out and you need to just acknowledge, God, I just haven't been living according to or pursuing your wisdom at all. And I need to ask for your forgiveness. I need to start from ground zero. And I need to just acknowledge that I have broken all of your wise laws and commandments. And God, I I need a fresh start. I need to be forgiven of my sin. And God, I want to put all my trust in what Jesus has done for me in his death and his resurrection. And you just need to start by saying, God, I want you to forgive me. And I want you to save me. And I want you to become the leader and king of my life. And so we're going to put a reflection question up on the screen. And just use that as a prompt to pray into whatever situation the Lord puts on your heart. Or maybe, maybe it's not this particular question at all. Maybe it's just to start by saying, God, would you save me? Would you change me? Would you take my life and help me to flourish according to your design? Take a moment between you and the Lord. Father, as we continue to reflect and to worship you, Lord, we start by just acknowledging and thanking you for not leaving us in the dark, but revealing yourself to us in in your scriptures, but ultimately in the person and work, the proclamation of Jesus. Lord, thank you for inviting us, inviting us into your wisdom into this life of flourishing. And God, I pray, Lord, that you would meet us where we are in whatever season of life we're in and you would lead us into the life that you have for us. Thank you for making that possible through Jesus, we pray in his name. Amen. Amen.